in breaking news if the Baltimore Ravens can't have him then neither can you Pittsburgh how about that Brandon Ayuk oh my goodness this thing feels like it has been going on for years and it's literally been months it's only been happening for months, but these months have seemed longer and longer and longer. We kept hearing little inklings and updates about Brandon Ayuk here and there, but really nothing. We heard a lot of just jibber-jabber, straight up. But with Brandon Ayuk, we were wondering where is he going to go, where is he going to end up. He talked about it. He was wearing that Pittsburgh hat that time, and he was just talking all this trash. And then he even went on the pivot talk with Ryan Clark and talked about possibly playing with Pittsburgh, possibly going to Washington, playing with his guy Jaden Daniels. Him and Jaden Daniels, they, they shared FaceTime pictures and all kind of stuff, man. It was like, where are you going to go? And then we kept hearing, all right, it's decided. Brandon Ayuk is going to the Pittsburgh Steelers. They done worked out a deal. And it was like, oh, okay, okay. I guess we're going to have to see Brandon Ayuk at least two times a year. All right, let's get We got the corners for it. We got the secondary for it. We prepared for something like that. But then we didn't hear anything. Then we talked about how, he apparently turned down a contract offer from the Patriots. He turned down a contract offer <laughs> from the Browns, too. <laughs> hey, look, he ain't turned down no contract offer from the Ravens. He ain't turned down no contract offer from us. Well, we ain't giving him one in the first place, but he still ain't turned us down. So that statement is still valid. But the biggest team that we kept hearing about was him going to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And... First, for some other teams, it was said that they would have to give up a, 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 a wide receiver in order to get him. Like for the Browns, if he would have went there, then they would have sent uh, the 49ers uh, Amari Cooper. But for the Steelers, it was said that they weren't going to have to give up a receiver to get Brandon Ayuk. And again, apparently this, this thing was so close with Pittsburgh. It was said that they had had the, the terms hashed out. Everything was agreed to. But for whatever reason, and we ain't complaining. It fell through. <laughs> so, <laughs> but Brandon Ayuk is staying in San Francisco, so he ain't going to Pittsburgh. And I mean, we already dealt with him last season. We wouldn't have no problem doing it, but I, it, it would have made the Pittsburgh Steelers better. Let, let's not even front. Um, Brandon Ayuk is nice. Uh, he, Ravens took care of him, but he, he's still uh, a nice receiver and a very productive, consistent uh, wide receiver. And now he's being paid accordingly. Um, but with the Pittsburgh Steelers, they already got George Pickens, and he's given the Ravens a little bit of trouble before. Um, but if they would have added Brandon Ayuk to that, and, and I mean, Pittsburgh Steelers have already given Ravens trouble without a Brandon Ayuk on their team. So if they would have added him, that would have just made them that much better than they currently are right now. Not better than the Ravens. It's, it's weird because Pittsburgh is not a better football team overall than the Baltimore Ravens, but they've been getting the Ravens numbers. just the weirdest thing. Anyway. He ain't going there. I'm happy about it. You should be too. Let's read the numbers on Brandon Ayuk. It says, there will be no trade. The 49ers and Brandon Ayuk reached an agreement today on a four-year extension that will contractually tie the wide receiver to San Francisco for the next one, two, three, four, five seasons. Per ESPN sources, the drama is over and a deal, not a trade, is in place. Whew. He got paid. So the deal is a, a four-year, $120 million contract extension with $76 mil in guarantees. Zay Flowers, my friend, you keep this up. You, you keep up what you've been doing. You keep up what you started last year. I kind of feel like Zay Flowers has been with us for longer than just a year, but he hasn't. Zay Flowers, you keep up what you done started. And these numbers, they're going to look like jump change to you. Brandon Ayuk is making $30 million per year season now if you look at the other wide receivers who are making a lot of money uh justin jefferson he getting paid 35 mil per uh cd lamb getting paid 34 mil per aj brown getting paid 32 mil Amra st brown he's getting 30.02 mil per tyreek hill getting 30 mil per brandon Ayuk is also getting 30 mil per now i know we like to do a lot of comparing when it comes to numbers and when it comes to money and stuff like that but is brandon Ayuk is he tyreek hill i don't think so honestly again y'all hear me say it all the time Best receiver in the league, in my opinion, is Tyreek Hill. You ask, people ask me, oh, if you could take one player from another team and add it to the Baltimore Ravens, who would it be on offense? It's Tyreek Hill every single time. Now, again, these guys are nice. Justin Jefferson, nice. CeeDee Lamb is like that. A.J. Brown, he one of them guys. But Tyreek Hill, I'm taking him all day, every day, over everybody. But anyway, Brandon Ayuk is getting paid more than uh, Devontae Adams and uh, more than Jalen Waddle. But guess what? <laughs> 
He's being paid by the 49ers and not the Pittsburgh Steelers, and that's all that matters to me. We got to talk about something that Eric DaCosta said that I was not the biggest fan of, but before we do, let's hear a word from our sponsor. I know we all looking for even more ways to keep it clean, right? Well, let me introduce you to Mando. Mando is a whole body deodorant literally for everywhere. Your neck, your back, your armpits, your legs, your feet, and anywhere where the sun don't shine. We said they're everywhere, right? Because unfortunately, body odor doesn't just stay in one place. But fortunately, Mando doesn't either because it's for everywhere. Here's Mando's four-in-one acidified cleansing bar. It's a five-ounce bar that does the work of shampoo, face wash, body wash, and deodorant. It's clinically proven to control odor for 24 hours. And it comes in three cologne quality scents. Mount Fuji is fresh and woodsy. Bourbon leather is sweet and sophisticated. And Pro Sport is clean and citrusy. Now here's my personal favorite for Mando, their bourbon leather body wash. Every time I use it, it got me feeling like a brand new man. And then it keeps me smelling really good too. So that's a nice bonus. But Mando's whole body deodorant is powerful enough for the toughest body odor, but gentle enough to use everywhere allowing you to put mando on those special somewheres without any worry because mando is aluminum free baking soda free cruelty free dye free and it's vegan but how can you get your hands on it well i'm getting ready to tell you mando's starter pack is perfect for new customers it comes with solid stick deodorant cream tube deodorant and two free products of your choice my choices ended up being the deodorant wipes and my personal favorite again the body wash and another bonus you get free shipping luckily i have a discount code to help you get hooked on my favorite smelling whole body deodorant on the market new customers get five dollars off a starter pack with our exclusive code that equates to over 40 percent off your starter pack use code engraven at shopmando.com s-h-o-p-m-a-n-d-o.com now there were so many great things that eric DaCosta said today there were so many good answers that he gave in his press conference today but there was just one part of the press where i was just like i can't agree with that one respectfully of course and with all love y'all already know that but to highlight a lot of the good things that he talked about he said that there's a lot of unknown on the offensive line, which we all can certainly agree on. He said that they made a decision to go young. And with a salary cap league, you cannot build a team with veterans at every single position. We get that. We understand that. He said you have to pay players, but you have to also draft and develop players as well. So Baltimore Ravens counting on their draft picks at offensive line. All right, let's see how it turns out. He said he's excited about Roger Rosengard and excited about Voy. He said they may have some hiccups along the way, but in a year from now, they'll be in a good place. Actually, hopefully in about a week from now, they'll be in a good place because you're going to go against the Chiefs. But anyway, he also said having Makari is like having an elite six man in basketball. That's the same thing that we've been saying about how the Baltimore Ravens feel about Pat Makari. A lot of people have wondered why he's not starting. Well, we said because the Ravens like him as that six man coming off the bench. He can play literally any single position. And Eric DaCosta confirmed that. He said right now, they're probably over the cap, but they'll make some moves in the coming days and weeks to get cap compliant, and they'll have some money to spend if a player comes available that can help them out. I believe the Baltimore Ravens are a little bit old, like 3 mil, 3.5 mil over the cap, something like that. But anyway, he talked about Bo Braid. He said Bo Braid really earned his spot on the roster. He said the Packers game was a joke. He said it was hard to watch, and he could not wait for that game to be over. Oh, EDC, you were right there watching with us. I told y'all they'd be watching the streams, so he was right there rocking with us. He said, Bo played great and was consistent, and he not only took, but he won the job. So shout out to Bo Brave for being an undrafted rookie free agent at a crowded safety position and still making the roster after the Baltimore Ravens drafted a safety, after the Baltimore Ravens signed two veteran safeties. So there were three safeties. That, were, that got added to the roster And they already had three safeties on the roster And he still made Man, that, that, that's something right there, man That really is something right there But anyway, continuing He was asked about picking up Adafi Oway's 50-year option He said that as fans We want to evaluate players by their sack production And that's so true that, that's, that's such a great point But he said that with Adafi Oway He's a guy that impacts games and played well last year Which he did overall He didn't get the numbers all the way and he had some rough moments or whatnot, but overall, we did see the improvements. But anyway, he said, we feel like he's going to make another jump. His ability to disrupt and make things happen. Uh, he also talked about Rashad Bateman, said that with Rashad Bateman, he answered it perfectly, too. He said that half of it, what's going on with him, is on Rashad Bateman. It's about him staying on the field, being healthy, and about him catching the ball. He also said the other part is him getting the opportunity. He said the contract gives them and him an opportunity to really see what he's got. It does, because it's a very low-risk uh, contract, and if Rashad Bateman lives up to exceeds expectations then it'll be a bargain especially when you look at all these receivers around the league and what they're getting paid it'll be a bargain 
But if he does, we ain't even got to talk about if he doesn't because he will. Anyway, he talked about Lamar Jackson. He said Lamar Jackson looks fast as heck. He used team keep it clean. I appreciate that, EDC. He said uh, he's throwing the ball extremely well. But his urgency as a leader with all the other players, he's so engaged with the coaches and the teammates. Said that they be even talking personnel after practice. Looked like Lamar trying to become a GM. But he said he just really wants to win badly. He talked about how he feels like Mark Andrews and Isaiah Likely will be the best tandem in the NFL, guess he's throwing a little note to Todd Munkin, like, hey, make that happen, but anyway, um, now, this was the part that initially, when I first saw this, I saw a quote, I saw the quote on Twitter, and I was like, ooh, I, I don't like that, but you know what, I don't want to misinterpret this quote, I don't want to just take this quote and run with it, and then just go off of that, I want to hear the entire question that was asked, and I want to hear the entire answer that was given, and then, I can give my honest assessment on what was said. So the question was, sometimes you hear fans say, this team can't prove anything else to me during the regular season. It's all about what happens in January. What do they do at the end? How do you balance that urgency to win the Super Bowl with knowing all the steps you have to go through to even have that chance? And that's a great question. Very, very, very great question. And that is something that, after that AFC Championship lost to the Chiefs last year, you heard so many Ravens fans say it. And actually, you heard a lot of Ravens fans say it even before then. Like, because that, that's how a lot of Ravens fans, that's where a lot of Ravens fans are at right now. Regular season is like, okay, cool. And we, of course, appreciate the regular season, but so many Ravens fans are like, look, we know Ravens are going to be all right in the regular season. If Lamar Jackson's healthy, we know they're going to be just fine. But what are they going to do come playoff time? How are they going to act come playoff time? Are they going to be themselves? Are they going to end up being a whole different Ravens team in playoffs? What are they going to do? But anyway, Eric DeCosta's answer. He said, if I had to rank some of the best Ravens teams, I'd say 2000, 2006, 2011, 2019, and 2020, 20, excuse me, in 2023. He said, the 2012 team, we got hot late. There's only one team that ends up being happy. So, true. He's right. He's right. And, and even going back to the ranking of the teams, he said 2000, but he said that that, that team was very lopsided because obviously the defense was, they like took over like crazy. 2006, that was heartbreaking, crushing year to actually lose with such a great team. 2011, that's where they came close, but obviously no cigar. Uh, 2019, yeah, 14, until we know there's 12 games in a row. And 2023, last year, we don't really want to talk about it, but you know, it, it was such a, it was a great team, historically great team too, especially the triple crown winners in this day and age to get something like that. Ooh, <laughs> but yeah, all for not necessarily nothing, but yeah. Anyway, um, there's only one team that ends up being happy. That's true because out of 32 teams, which is great, that's a lot of teams. Only one team wins a Super Bowl. Only one. 31 other teams, they end up coming up short. But he also said, my goal is to build a team that has talent at every position. Okay, I'm with you on that. He also said, that's flexible enough to withstand injuries. I'm with you on that. He also said, where we have depth to get us through a long season. I'm with you on that. And to make the playoffs. I'm still with you, EDC. I ain't going nowhere. And then he said, and to be ascending. At that right time. Okay, I get it. So you want to have that momentum going into the playoffs and ascending. Not descending, but ascending. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm still with you. He said it's really hard to project. It's mentally challenging too. And this is where it got a little tricky. He said, I think we've had the best record twice in the last five or six years. Okay. And we didn't make it to the end. Right there. Right there. That right there is where it got tricky for me. Because if you have the best record in the NFL, especially like look at last year, best team in the league. They were the best team in the league last year. And they were that, I don't want to say by far, but by far. Especially the end of the season, how they were beating up on teams. And another team that so many of the NFL pundits and fans and media all said, oh, no, these guys are probably the best team in the NFL. Ravens whooped them in their house. That being the San Francisco 49ers. So that's when Ravens really established, like, no, look, we are really like that. And another thing, too, 
You look at a team like the Miami Dolphins, I ain't even trying to take a shot at the Dolphins, but Dolphins had a nice record. But when you looked at the Dolphins' record versus winning teams, it was like, ugh, yuck, who is this? Dolphins were beating up on the bad teams, making it look like they were something serious, but not the Baltimore Ravens. That's what made them even more real last year because they will go against playoff teams. They will go against teams that had winning records, and they will go slaughter them. It wouldn't even be close. It's like, man, these Ravens are serious. But we know what happened in the end. Anyway, um, he talked about they've had the best record twice in the last five to six years, and they didn't make it in the end. He said, I'm proud of what we accomplished. We haven't accomplished our ultimate goal, but here it is right here. I don't subscribe to the idea that your season's a failure if your team doesn't win the Super Bowl. That right there. And I know we've talked about this before, and I've said this myself. We talked about this after that AFC championship game. And I felt like, I know that there was some failure. Like, oh, no, it wasn't a failure. I feel like it is a failure. And for a couple of different reasons. If we are talking about a team, not trying to take no shots at no other teams, anything like that. But if we're talking about a team like the old Lions, who they were just really, really bad. If we were talking about Jets before Aaron Rodgers, they really, really bad. We're talking about the Browns now. <laughs> They're they not really, really bad, but recent Browns before, well, even with Deshaun. Well, but anyway, Browns, they've they been at the bottom of the AFC North for a little minute. But if we're talking about a team that has not been good, has not been in contention, has not been in the playoffs, has not been so close, has not had MVPs at the quarterback position, has not been super, super successful during the regular. If we're talking about a team like that, and then you say, oh, well, not if, if we didn't make the Super if we didn't win the Super Bowl, excuse me, then it's not a failure of a season. I can get it. Because Super Bowl, every, every team will say it. Oh, yeah, we want us to win a Super Bowl this year, but that's not your true aspiration. Especially if you've been at the bottom, you've been just kicking and scratching just to, to stay alive as a team and whatnot. If you've been struggling for a hot minute, then yeah, the Super Bowl is not going to be your goal. If you're going from, well, we got 17 games in the season, say for instance, a team goes 4-13. Four and, uh, four and 13. They go 4-13. and 13. Ooh, that's a terrible record. Then that team, the following year, if, if they, for them just to get over 500, that's going to be a successful season for them because they went from 4-13 and 13 to getting an over 500 record. That's a big turnaround, huge turnaround. But for a team like the Baltimore Ravens, who just last year had the number one seed, and obviously when Lamar Jackson is healthy, when he's playing, they're always in the playoffs. They've had the number one seed tw not once but twice, two times. They always in the thick of things when Lamar Jackson is playing. They're right there. For them, not winning a Super Bowl, especially for the situations that they've been in with their team, that's a failure. That's failing. It is. Because, you, you, and I know people have been like, oh, well, they, they made it a little farther each year, which is great. That's, that's amazing. I love that for them, and I hope they make it even farther this year. Well, two times as farther because make it through the AFC Championship, not only to the Super Bowl, but winning the Super Bowl. But anyway, with the teams that they've had, with the rosters that they've built, oh, my goodness, they done had some rosters. Not winning at all has been a failure because I know it ain't just to make the playoffs. That, that's not a successful season. Especially because, again, er every team is not in the same situation. Every team, in my opinion, should not and does not have the same standards for success. Like we just talked about, if a team is failing, if a team has been struggling and they've been under 500 for so long and they get over 500, that's success for them. But for the Baltimore Ravens, they always over 500. They always over 500. They, they always in the playoffs and doing their thing. And... But not getting to where you need to go. And, and I get it. It's only been the Chiefs. It's only been Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, and, and Matt Stafford. Those have been the guys who've been winning all the Super Bowls recently. All of them. And that's crazy to think about. And I get it. Only one team can win the Super Bowl. So I know somebody. So you mean to tell me that 31 teams should look at their season as a failure? No. Not 31. Because not all of them make the playoffs. 
and there are some that are consistent. Like teams that I would look at um, as if they don't make the Super Bowl as it was a failed season, Baltimore Ravens, yeah, uh, the Dallas Cowboys, uh, the Buffalo Bills, uh, the, the Bengals when Burrow is healthy, um, can't can't say the Chiefs because Chiefs they they all they only make the Super Bowl. The the Philadelphia Eagles. You get like teams that are in the playoffs, teams that do a good amount of winning. And and there's plenty more. Well, not plenty more. San Francisco 49ers. That's another one too. Like, think about them. Think about them. Do you think the San Francisco 49ers, who back in 2012 with the Baltimore Ravens, they were in the Super Bowl loss. You think they look at that season like, oh, well, you know what? This season wasn't a failure. You think the San Francisco 49ers, who have been to countless NFC championships games recently, and the, I think they, they lost one a couple years ago, right? But they, they've won plenty of them, too, because they were just in the Super Bowl in, what, 2019 against the Chiefs. You think the fact that they made it to the Super Bowl and they lost that one, too? They, oh, man, you know what? That was sure a successful season. No, you lost the Super Bowl. Then, of course, last year, you get a nice rematch with the Chiefs. Oh, this could be the one. Nope, you lost. Do you think they look at it like, oh, you know what? This, this season, it wasn't a failure. It was. It was, especially if you made it all the way and you lost. It's a failure. And again, failures are different. There are different levels of failures in the NFL, in my opinion. But like I said, not every team should be judged and should be looked at the same because different teams are on different levels with this. Where the Baltimore Ravens are at right now, again, if they were a losing team, then just making a playoff, that would be a successful season in itself. That would be a successful season because if they came from losing, 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 then all of a sudden they make the playoffs, it's like, oh, yeah, they did it. But the fact that playoffs, I don't want to say they are shooting for playoffs, but they're pretty good. They're pretty good and pretty consistent at getting there. So the fact that you're consistently getting there, you consistently have some pretty good overall teams, you could clean it up in some areas, but you're still not getting to the ultimate going in and out winning, that's a failure. But EDC also said, because I, I went on a little tangent and I forgot to read the rest of his answer. He also said, uh, I don't subscribe to the idea that your season's a failure if your team doesn't win the Super Bowl. If I did, I'd probably be in a mental institution. I'm halfway there. He said, uh, I measured the success of a season with a lot of different things, Super Bowl being one of those things, but certainly not the only criteria that I'd use to judge a season. It's not the only criteria used to judge a season. I, I get that part. But it is the ultimate criteria you use to judge a Baltimore Ravens season because all seasons are not created equal, my friend. They're not. All teams' seasons are not judged equally or created equally. So Baltimore Ravens are a lot different than a lot of these other teams in the NFL. Therefore, they have to be judged accordingly. So Team Keep It Clean, got to give a special shout out to the newest Team Keep It Clean patron. He was trolling heavy yesterday. I told you yesterday was just trolling grave in that national day. But yesterday, after we dropped the video, and a little after the video, he decided to become a Team Keep It Clean patron. It's the newest Team Keep It Clean patron, our guy, Mike. So Mike, shout out to you. Appreciate you. Any questions you ever want answered, because you got priority because you're a Team Keep It Clean patron, you send them directly on Patreon. As a matter of fact, let's get to some questions. First question, since we were on the topic of the EDC press, it came from my guy, George. He said, hey, Raven, hope you and your family are good. It's been a while since I sent in a question, and this may be more of a rant than a question, but here it is. I think I, I know something, a little something about rants, but anyway, come on. He said, being in the live chat this morning for the EDC press, and I couldn't help but see all the negativity from fans, everything from how cheap the Costa is on offense, when in reality, it's one position they have been cheap at, and that's why I'd receive him. Because at the time, Lamar Andrews, Stanley were the highest paid at their positions. Well, that's that's true. Um, now for Lamar, <laughs> it took a lot of fighting to get there. It took oh, oh, it took a whole lot of fighting. It was, uh, and it got so ugly, very very ugly. Um, but anyway, uh, but yeah, you are right. Stanley, Andrews, Lamar, they were the highest uh, paid at their positions. Um, then he said how bad our GM, uh, people were saying how bad our GM and head coach are, yet they are universally praised by peers and players alike as being some of the best at their position. I get the AFC Championship game has left a bad taste in most fans' mouth, but here it is a new year and the negativity seems to outweigh the excitement. So here's a question. Before we get to your question, the reason that that is, 
and now nah, I'm I'm not a I'm not a big fan of negativity, but I I do while you you can still be positive and still voice your frustrations or opinions honestly. Um, there's a way to say it. It can, it can be very very tough, which I get. It, it's extremely extremely tough. Um, now with the GM with the head coach of people saying how bad they are. You talked about how they're universally praised by peers and players alike as being some of the best at their positions. Now, with Ravens fans, we hear that. We see that. Of course, we, we've hear, heard it for years. Eric DeCosta, one of the best in the league. Eric DeCosta is amazing. John Harbaugh, one of the best in the league. John Harbaugh is a good coach. Now, um, the thing that has been so frustrating for Ravens fans is that we hear that every single year, all the time, but then when things get the toughest in, in, in the worst situations that's when they have the worst moments not even eric DaCosta, because he just he puts the team together he ain't out there coaching but in the worst at, at the worst possible times they have the worst moments this team has the worst moments where does that start who does that start with that's a rhetorical question i'm legend you can answer in the comment section if you want to but who does that start with this team has the worst moments at the worst possible times every time Fans consistently see, because we're fans, so we watch. We watch all the games. And if we're seeing the same thing happen at the same time, that's why so many fans are frustrated. Are frustrated, excuse me. That's why they're frustrated, because they're just tired of seeing the same thing. But anyway, continuing. He said, uh, are we as Ravens fans spoiled? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great problem to have. You want your fans to be spoiled, because that means you do a lot of winning. But Baltimore Ravens fans are spoiled to an extent. We regular season spoiled. That's what, oh yeah, we, we boasting, we bragging, we got our chests out, we feeling our team, we feeling our we like, yeah, Raven flock, baby, hey, I see you, man, what's up, man? But then playoffs, yeah, that's a little bit different. But anyway, he said, let me explain in a moment. Uh, it seems most fans want EDC to do the Rams approach as to go all in and trade away all assets, uh, damage the cap for years, to come for one Super Bowl, then be irrelevant for, irrelevant for five years. As some fans like myself want to be relevant year after year with the opportunity to bring home the Lombardi. Either view is okay depending on what you as a fan are looking forward to in the future. However, it just seems that this time fans should be excited for the Ravens in the upcoming season, not bickering about past shortcomings, which all teams and organizations deal with. We should be ready for another championship caliber run and be behind our Ravens. See, let me stop right there. It's not that fans are not behind the Ravens because they certainly are. They just want to see something different. They, they tired of the same old stuff. That's all it is. Fans are tired of the same old stuff, the same old results. Fans are tired of the heartbreak. And then that, I get it. That's part of being a fan. But fans, they do not want to see the Baltimore Ravens go down the same exact road that they keep going down, especially when they have the most powerful team in the league. That's what hurts the most. That's what hurts the most. It's not even, well, it is that the, the Ravens, they, 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 when they get bounce out of the playoffs that hurts a lot because that's it it ain't no like coming back next week but it's how they've been losing especially when they have the number one not just the number one seed but the number one team in the league and i know both of those kind of go hand in hand but when they have the best teams in the league and the way that they just abandon who they are at the worst moments and they do that consistently that's why ravens fans are so upset that's why ravens fans are so frustrated because they don't want to see that. And now, let me give you another reason, too. The game is seven days away from now. The, the week one of the season. And so many Ravens fans, after that AFC Championship game, they tuned out. They, they, they checked out. They, they checked out completely out of YouTube, out of everything. They did not want to talk Ravens. They didn't want to see Ravens. Nothing. I know for me, like, the views went, like, way down. Because people, did, they did not want to see nothing. with And I know it happened to a lot of other people, too. They did not want to see nothing with the Baltimore Ravens. Nothing. Nothing. So now what's happening is it's about timing. Because fans are now being reminded. Because the game's a week away. And, you know, every single day, as we get closer and closer, especially on the day of and the night of, there are going to be so many replays of Ravens, Chiefs, AFC Championship game. From January, whatever, 2024, whatever the date was. You're going to be seeing so many highlights of that. So many people talking about it. So now Ravens fans are just being reminded of it all over again. So that's making them frustrated, making them hurt, making them all kinds of negative feelings toward that game and toward that feeling that they had last season and how it ended. And now they're being reminded of everything all over again. 
So that's why Ravens fans may seem a little bit negative, may seem a little bit extra worked up, may seem a little bit irritated because they're getting reminders all over again because you're going against the Chiefs, you're going against the Super Bowl champions, you're going against a team that you feel the Baltimore Ravens should be in their place. And not even just last year, but even in previous years, especially 2019 was another one. That was another one too. It just seems like, hey, and, and I know the Chiefs won another Super Bowl in, in between it, but it's like when the Ravens got the number one seed, that's when the Chiefs end up winning the Super Bowl. Because in 2019, same thing. Same thing. But anyway, continuing. He said, winning the Super Bowl is so hard as the best teams rarely win it. So much has to go right, and you even have to get a little lucky to lift the Lombardi Trophy. Even if you are the best team, everything has to align. So do the Ravens have to go through a few years of turmoil like Jacksonville or Arizona for fans to truly be appreciative for the first-class organization we are lucky to have? And if you had a choice, would you be okay with five years of irrelevance for one more Super Bowl or be in contention every year with the chance to win one? You want my honest answer? You you do or or you you I, I think you do. Um, I will go all in for that one. I'll take that one because Ravens have been rather and, and again I mean either way I get it. But so you asking me would I rather guarantee one Super Bowl win and then five years of uh or years and years and years of uh I mean not uh be but being a good team but not making a Super Bowl. I know it's a tough question, but Super Bowl, that's ultimate. That's it. That's, that's the ultimate goal. And there's only one Super Bowl champion every single year. Just one. Just one. And, like, you think about it, too. You said, um, would you be okay with five years of irrelevance for one more Super Bowl or be in contention every year? Like, I mean, and I get it. Yeah, you would rather be in contention every year. But if you win it, if you win that one year, like, Ravens have won every 12 years. They won every 12 years. So that's actually longer than just the five-year plan. So you see, that's, that's more than double the five-year plan. It's 12 years. And we've had some great teams during, in, in the middle of those 12 years. We had some times where, it's, but we, we've, for the most part, the teams have been pretty good. And they, most, for the most part, they do a good amount of winning. But yeah, anyway, he said, again, there's no wrong answer. I guess I personally would just want to be in it every year with a chance to win it all. I feel as though fans, are, are we are too quick to critique things and not support a great thing that we have right in front of us. Let's enjoy the moment. Ravens 2024, 2025. Shout out to my guy, George. Ooh, this is uh, an episode right here. Anyway, next question came from my guy, Martin. He said, man, Commander's got my guy. He talking about Noah Brown because Commander signed him yesterday. Uh, he said, um, but hey, who knows? Tylen Wallace has been promising maybe with a bigger role, he'll do more. I just don't like our wide receiver depth that much, and I really think Noah Brown would have helped. He would have, but yeah, hey, Ravens, they, this is what they're doing. This is who they're rolling with. It's like, all right, cool. Let's see how it goes. Hope for the best. Hope for the best. And we know that they're going to be relying heavily on Mark Andrews. I mean, as they do every year, because he's one of their best players, but also Isaiah Likely. Hopefully they can, they can incorporate him um, with a, and there can be a, a healthy dynamic with Mark Andrews and Isaiah Likely. Um, along as they flat there. Like, again, we, we, we done talked about this all offseason, so y'all get it already. But Ravens just got to, they just got to mash it all together the right way. They got all these different ingredients, but how's that recipe going to turn out? We're going to see soon. Next question came from my guy, Mason. He said, do you think the Ravens brought back Cunningham because he can play wide out? And you never know, could he be that emergency QB if Leary wasn't brought up that week? That's a big two-for-one deal. Shout out to my guy, Mace. I like that. You could tell that he is a smart shopper, especially if you go grocery shopping. You're talking about that two-for-one at BOGO? Let's get it, baby. Buy one, get one. Anyway, um, Mace, for Malik Cunningham, I do. I think he's sort of a, like an X-Factor type of player because you, um, you have somebody that has played quarterback, but you have that same person. They showed it. They could play some receiver, too. And then that same person, the Ravens, I don't know how it went, but the Ravens, they tried him out at kick return, bump return, too. They tried him out as a return man as well. So it ain't just two for the price of one, but it's a possible three for the price of one. And he's on a practice squad. So you're not even paying a big price. But I, I just think that he, I think Ravens just see something in him. I feel like they don't know exactly where to put him at yet. 
but they see something in him so we're like hey we, we got to try to keep him around to see what this could turn into so these next questions two quick questions came from my guy ricky williams now are you the Ricky Williams, not the former Miami dog, not the former New Orleans, but the former Baltimore Raven, Ricky. Is that you, Ricky? Hopefully you team keep it clean. Now, anyway, he said, hey, Raven, this is Ricky Williams. I've been trying for some time now to get my questions featured in one of your videos. All you had to do was send an email. That's it. That's it. Like, you, you, have you really been trying? I ain't getting no email from you. But anyway, he said, I uh, hope all is well with you and yours as we get ready for this new season. Everything is great. I'll be seeing you in the a, in a, in a live stream. So I appreciate you always coming through to the live stream. He said, so which coach in the AFC North, based on their success in the NFL, would be the hardest to replace if fired? Ooh. You, this, this, man, this man really said two quick questions and going to start off like that. Um. Mm. Who would be the hardest coach to replace in the AFC North? Um, if fired, wow, based on their success in the NFL. Mm, I would say right now for AFC North, I would say John Harbaugh, but hear me out because I know I already, I already know how people are. I, know, I already know. The reason I say John Harbaugh, the reason is because with the talent that the Baltimore Ravens have on this team at a lot of different positions, maybe not every single position like that, like that, but at a lot of different positions at quarterback, at running back, um, at tight end, uh, at safety, at cornerback, at linebacker. We're going to see about that pass rush now. Hey, just stay healthy. And we, we, we talking about that one too. Um, but with, the talent that the Baltimore Ravens have at a lot of different positions and like pre mid, like high quality talent at a lot of different positions. John Harbaugh got fired. Um, then the coach that came in to replace him, we would immediately be like, Hey, look, like Harbaugh had his talent and couldn't get it done recently. Could not finish the job. The Ravens kept failing. You new head coach, you have to do better. You have to do better. That's what you were brought in here to do, to get past where John Harbaugh could not get past. So I feel like he would have more that would be on his plate from jump. When you think about it, you think about the other teams in the AFC North, the Browns, self-explanatory. But you think about the Steelers. Steelers, the big thing that, that, that they have, that, that they hang their hat on, or hang their head on, whatever the saying is, is that they keep finishing over 500. If Mike Tomlin got fired and a new coach came in, he finishes over 500. Steelers like, oh, yeah, we kept the streak going. That is uh, not, not saying that Mike Tomlin is a bad coach, but, again, that record thing is just, for me, it's just like, ah, like, there's got to be something better than that. Come on now. Oh, the, the fact that they just keep staying over 500, it's like, all right, now, come on now. But um, so I feel like if, if he got fired and a, a new coach came in, then that would be what he has to do. Stay above 500 or, or get a little, a little higher over 500 and not be so close to 500. For the Bengals, for Zach Taylor, if he were to get fired, it's tricky there because of Joe Burrow and the, the, the recently how uh, he's missed those season. But again, they did play and they made it to AFC Championship. They made it to the Super Bowl. Um, so that one would be tricky. But I feel like as far as with the consistency, uh, it would be John Harbaugh. He would be the one. And he said, and what team would keep their current success or get progressively better if their coach was? Oh, my goodness. You said too quick. This is not no too quick questions, man. He said, what team would keep their current success or get progressively better if their coach was fired at the end of the 2024 season? Keep in mind the current 2024 roster makeup going into the future for each team. Oh, my goodness. Um, I would, which team would keep their current success or get progressively better? I would say the Steelers. I would say the Steelers, and I would also say, depending on who, it could also be the Baltimore Ravens. It really could. Now, it would be tough, but it could also be the Baltimore Ravens. Because, again, the talent's there. The talent is there. The rosters, they've been there. But every single time, again, that's why Raven fans are so upset. Because they get to the play and they change their complete identity. Where does it start from? 
You tell me anyway. He said, I'll start. Oh, oh, I, I didn't even see that he answered the question. He said, I'll start. I have one answer for both. John Harbaugh. Oh, my goodness. See, I should have read that. Well, you know what? No, I don't take that back. I, I should not have read the whole thing. I didn't even know he answered. He said, I'll start. I have one answer for both. John Harbaugh, I have many reasons that I think you would agree with based on the team as a whole since Lamar took over. Feel free to agree or disagree with my personal opinion. Much love either way. Oh, no, you know it's all love. It's all love every day, all day. Um, but yeah, so I guess we, we kind of on the same page with that. Also, for y'all that be going to all them Ravens games, man, I be getting so envious of y'all sometimes because being there is just, it's different. And if you get a chance to go, please go. Please go. If you don't do it for nobody, do it for us. The, please go. It'll be so worth your time. Anyway, uh, on September 29th against those Buffalo Bills, they going to be in the All Blacks, which we love. But then November 7th against them Cincinnati Bengals Thursday Night Football at the crib at M&T Bank. It's going to be the Purple Rising Church. So the new jersey with the new helmets. So you're going to get to see that live and in person. Oh, that's going to be sweet, man. 